okay? So look at the um, different models here, the PPE models, the SPE models, <coughs> the parallel programming models for those of you that want to work in parallel models, and then the multitasking SPE and the self-software development flow. The first one, um, the focus of this one is why we need this kind of programming models. The massive computational abilities that we have under the cell architectures and we have a huge communication bandwidth. We move data at the rate of 300 sub-bytes per second. We move the data independently between the SPE and also between the other PPEs. Okay? Our resources are distributed. We distribute resources across different levels in terms of low level, like the, um, the functional components of our SPU or, S or PPU, in terms of tasking, in terms of threading. What are we waiting for the, uh, the fixing of this one? The programming model, you look carefully, right? We can have a situation. The least thing we have ASPE, and then we have the models based on the memory requirements of the applications. So now you can tie up the memory models against the, uh, against the, um, the, the cell architecture. You can have a situation where you have your, 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 your programs fit the total of your program address space, fit into the local store of one SPE. On the other hand, you can have that address space spreading across the EA effective address of your main memories and also to your uh, SPE as well. The other scenario where you have is that your address space of your SPE program here may be across different uh, SPE. Either to cover the whole eight SPE or maybe across a couple of SPE. And then at the, SP, at the VE level, here's the case where you have the, uh, the address space cover also the, um, the EA, the main memory here, and also the address space of the local store on different SPE. And then the last situa situation where you have the PPE threads running on different, um, um, on, on the PPE here, running at different instances of PPE. Let's take a look at the PPE programming model. We went through an example yesterday, very simple example, just to show you, you can build a PPE program. And that PPE programs will, will do nothing else but to control the executions of your SPU program. Control and managing that SPU is the key function, the main function of this, uh, of this, uh, this PPU programs. We provide what we call the CE soft, the cell embedded software um, format here, linkage formats, to allow you to refer to the same program using a symbolic name to refer to the same address space between the, uh, the EA and the local store. So you don't have to do any mapping, you don't have to do any translation, you don't have to worry about 64 bits versus 32 bits on the cell here. Okay, the, the role of the PPE programs, of course, manage, locate the system resources as well as the cell resources. It will do the printf, the file I.O., all of those um, I.O. Um, requests for, you, for your programs. Do we have any things down there in the SPU to do any printing? No, we don't have any things. Right? All we have is just a, a vector machines running in some computations. That's all. Single SPE programs, we have a, a small program, program uh, a small programming model and a large programming model. The, the small single SPE models, we refer to that model as a single task environment. It's small enough to fit into a 256 gb of uh, local store. Sufficient for many dedicated workloads. How sufficient it is? What is the size of the program that you think that can run on the local store on that 256 gb How many lines of code do you think that will run? 20 lines, 30 lines, 100 lines, 500 lines of code. You can run a program 500 lines of code on that 256 gb Okay, so it is small, but not very small. That can accommodate a very large size program. Okay, and then the, um, we mentioned about the uh, address space between the EA 
and the, uh, and, the, um, and the local store. There's a line that delimit the address space. And the mapping of the address space will be done by your MMU and the MFC. Everything is done for you by, throwing, by, by going through the DMAID and by going through some of the, of, of the, of the um, uh, memory uh, transfer functions. Uh, go to the MMIO, for example. Those will be translated automatically for you. So you have to concern about it. So in the small environment, small single SPE programming model, everything will be dandy, nice and dandy. The tool and environment, we give you the compilers, we give you some of the, um, um, the libraries, the linking, the linker, the loaders that initialize, load, start, stop your program. So this is the typical environment that you have. A sample programs for this environment, like um, this program here, we call the SPE underscore full dot C, so a C program to so compile it and then produce a binary called the SPE underscore full. We have an integer SPE ID, address 64 arguments, right, and then 64 bit of the environment pointer. We've seen it this before, right? This is the SPE thread, right? And then we do something over here based on the argument that we pass here. Then we do printf, whatever, return zero or return i. Now this is the PPU program. And we do the status, declare the SPE ID here. It's the SPE underscore uh, ID underscore T. Do the thread creations. Do some wait here and return. We have to declare the program's SPE underscore foo, which is an SPU program. Declare it as an external. SP underscore program handler underscore T. Seen that many times, right? That's basically, that is it. However, in a large program, what happened in the case where we have a program and that address space you know, is larger than the 256K byte? What are we going to do? And here, in this environment, what we can do is can partition the programs into different segment address space. We have the uh, code segment, we have the data segment, we have only stuff, all right, and C soft as well. We partition into small pieces and then we demate the pieces that we need whenever we need to run on the demate here, on, on, the, on, the, on the SPE here. Okay, the control of passing or breaking up or managing of these programs rests with the PPE. So here we use the PPE breaking the, the code and the data into small pieces, DMA down to transfer the data down to the SPE program, perform some calculation, and return it back to the, um, um, to the, to the PPE. For I.O., we would do the same thing. For I.O., we DMA the data. For example, in, in this case, the int declared by the IP32 here, an array of, of 32 locations, and then 32 entries here. We fit it to the programs ops with a function IB uh, function um, of with the argument IP here. Perform the operation, generate the output, and DMA back to the uh, system memory, which is the main program running over here. Okay, for those of you who us, you tell me yesterday, right? You show me that every time I do the DMA, I issue DMA request, I wait for the data coming back, some cycle later, and then I continue to work. What happened to that latency time? What I'm going to do with while I'm, I'm waiting for the data? The scheme is said that, okay, we can provide you some sort of um, mechanism we call the software managed cache. Software managed cache is a, nothing else but a software implemented cache. Just like the concept of the hardware cache that you had before in the, in, in the architectures, we use as a, a small locations where we um, we will, where we store some frequently referenced data in there. Okay, when we need the data, we go search that, go to that location, search for the data, right? And then if the data is there, we load that data. If not, then we generate something like the data is not there, some cache phone or something. We go on outside, either the next level of memory or the, the next next level of memory. We bring the data in. On the hardware side, we need to deal with cache replacement algorithms, the size of the cache, all of these um, um, 
organization, how do we organize the cash as well, right? How many lines of cash? How do we group that line of cash into? How many sets of cash, right? The, the way that we organize the cash. We do with the same here. However, here, we will leave, we will give you, as a programmer, the flexibilities of how to organize those cash. So, once you decide the name of the cash, the type of data that you use in, in that cash, and how, what is, the, uh, what is the replacement algorithm that you use in this cash, you use the cash. You store the, the data here. Storing does mean that this cash will do the DMA for you. What technique, what DMA technique that this cash will use? Double buffering or, or, or command list, or the form of DMA com command list? You don't care. Right? The implementer, the software cash implementer implement this scheme for you. All you need to know is that I have this data type, right? I define a cache and this data type. Okay, and I have this interface I call to load the read the cache or, or store the cache. Store the data the cache or read the, the data out from the cache. And that's, that's it. When I need the data, I go to this cache. Then I'm supposed to have the data ready for me. Prefetching the data is another function of this software cache. How many software cache can I have? How many hardware cache can you have on your system? One, right? Can you say that, well, I don't like that cache. Can I replace that cache by different size or whatever? Can we? No way, right? On the hardware side, let's go to Intel. Say that Intel, give me some scheme where I don't like the cache size, you know, and the cache, cache size and the line, of your, the size of your cache line, and you know, how you organize the cache. Let me make another cache. No way. Once the de decision on the, on the hardware side, once the decision on the size, how to implement that cache was, was uh, made, you cannot change. On this end over here, you do have the opportunity to change the cache. The size of the buffer, which is the buffer, nothing else but the buffer, right? The size of the buffer, the data type you, you put in here, and the organization of the cache. Plus, on this, uh, on, on this organization here, how many cache can you have? On the hardware side, one cache. How many cache can you have? Two, three, four, five, right? This is depending on what? Subject to? Well, the size of the, your local store. Performance-wise, subject to some things that you have to live with. That means that you have 256 k by. You reserve some buffer for your software cache. The remaining for your instruction, for your data. And coming back, you know, how, how do I know the size of my instruction and so on, you know, through the linker and through some of the, of the tool provided, uh, option provided by the compiler, it should spit out, you know, the size of, out, um, of our code segment and data segment. So we would know. So the, the programmer has a lot of freedom, right, to manipulate, to set up the cache, to set up the buffers down in the local store here. You want to, do, to, to use the raw DMA, to transfer the data by yourself, fine, you do have that option. You want to use some option already provided to you to do the DMA for you, to get the data for you, use the software cache. Here is at the low level API, we provide some of these functions. We call the, uh, dependent, um, the low level API, where we define the cache missing, the line, the byte, uh, the return, some return address here, and then the cache miss and so on. Those are very low level API that we provide here for the, um, for the software guys to implement this cache um, uh, strategy. At the other, other end, we also provide what we call the high level API. The high level APIs here, we, say, we define that. Let's define, okay, given me some heading, some definition in the sp underscore h dot h. sp underscore cache dot h where I define a load and a store. Loading is that I read cache, SPE cache read some address, right? And read some data out of cache here. And here is cache write. I will write some data, some piece of data here in, in, in the cache. And then when I refer to in my main programs, right? On the SPE program, when I refer to, I do the, the load, I read something and see it here, and I store C into some destination. Is that it? We make the scheme like, you know, very, very uh, complicated. 
but you as a programmer, you're dealing with only definition of this, you have to define these guys here, and then when you use it, you need to load and store the cache. Okay? We hide all of these details of DMA and all of the rest of the complexity of DMA. On the large single SP programming models, we know that we have a code segment, we have the data segment, and we can we know the size of the programs. Each of the segments we know ahead of the size. Right? When we sum up the size, we said, wow, the, the adding to the submissions, the sum of the size of all my segments are exceeding 256 k byte. Can I break up those size? Can I break them up and in such a way that I can load them, one of them, two of them, or three of them on the same location using the overlay techniques? This overlay approach is not new. We're dealing with the 64 k byte memories when we invent the power of the, um, the first PC. Then we have to load a program larger than 64 k byte or 128 k byte or larger than 256 k byte. What we're doing? What we did then, we break the, the, the code into small pieces, we call segment, right? And we look at if they're independent to each other, do they refer to each other? reserve a specific address location, a, um, a segment of address space into memories and loading those segments only when we need it. Instead of loading the home program when it's standard program. The same concept right here in the self programming environment when you run a, an SPE program, when you need, when you load a program, you load everything. That's why you have so large. Right. If you have your large address space, you cannot fit the program into the, the, the local store. Break them up into small pieces. Into, for example, in this case, we break the program into different functions, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and the main program. The main programs, sort of like the, the root segment, has to be there all the time. That we have to do that, right? So main, the lower here, the main function main and F, somehow go together. We can load the main program and the F, sec and the F, pro and the F functions into this segment over here any time that we need them. Main always resident into the local store memories and F will be loaded into this segment here. And then on this segment over here, we can, we can define the load point for the function B or C so we can load either B or C when it need B or C. And this segment here, we define the load point here so we can load the SPE function A, D, or E. So we load this segment. Breaking up program into various segments, define the load points for those segments and overlay those segments loading together. How difficult it is, you will see. Okay, when you see it later on, we will cover the overlay. An example on um, showing this chart over here, we have a, a two overlay regions. We call the region one, region two. Region one, we load the segments of all of the, 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 the text. And segment two, data, text, and object, and so on. Segment two, again, okay, on the, um, the E executable, maybe. Yeah, objects and E, e format. And then the overlay is um, region two. We load the segment one and segment two on the B and C and so on. So using the features, you know, the, or the, um, the, the features provided by the SPU linker here, we can fit the linker, the data from this linker script and ask the SPU linker, link my segments in such a way that I can load the segment here only when I need it and it's very specific in the starting from the address define by the overlay regions that I define. This overlay manager will oversee, manage, and loading only segment for you. The other way we look at, we're on the system memory, you have a program, right? And then the program, you can divide into different uh, code and data segment again, and you can queue them up and then depending on the execution of the SP kernel, this is the SP kernel that you provide. Right? This is not a, a, 
Linux kernel and OS kernel. This is a small program that running in an SPE program, running on an, an, on an SPE, control the execution of those jobs here. It's running on looking for the code for the segment N and data N, go here, asking, request the DMA, the code N, and code for the data uh, of N, and then, you know, uh, running that executed one, and then and following through, you know, this job queue. We're also talking about another techniques that allow you to hide the latency. These techniques here we call the double buffering. In your traditional programming model, if you want to work in with a large set of data, or a set of data, but you want to continuously access the data, access the data in such a way that any time that you need the data, you have it. You can either load the data into a single buffer and accessing the buffer one at a time, right? Or you load the data in two buffers, break up the data into two buffers, right? And then accessing the buffer, and then accessing the buffer, the buffer one, getting data, process the data, working with that data, and accessing the second buffer, working on, and then accessing back to buffer one. You can do that providing that you load the data into the buffer one and buffer two the first time, right? If we go ahead and say, that, okay, now let me start my task. Before I start doing anything, let me load the data into buffer one. And then so also load the data into buffer two. While I'm waiting for the data in buffer one, buffer two, I have to spend some time waiting, right? And then I... Once I get the data on the buffer one, I process the data. I finish processing the data, I get out. Before I get out, I initiate another request for the data on the buffer one. So that activity is, being, is going on now. I, I switch to my buffer two, I work in my buffer two. Write the data, and now I have the data in buffer two. I'm working on, when I finish, before I getting out of buffer two, initiate another request for the, for the data, and then switch back on the buffer one. I switch back and forth, right? So that I always guarantee that I have the piece of data that I need. Some of you may subject, what happens if I have a different set of data or my data take longer on the buffer one or buffer two? Possible. You can make it double buffer, triple buffer, or multi buffering. Right? Your buffer is where? Your buffer is down the local store. What is the drawback on that? The drawback on that, on that scheme is memory constraint again, right? You have 256 gb. No matter what scheme you, you, you do and you apply, you still have to sacrifice certain space down there, right, to implement your scheme. Multi-buffering, double bufferings, or you're doing some software cache, it's still causing some time, it's causing some space. You're trading space for time. Okay, and the CSOF, we define this, the, um, this structure here so you, you don't have to resolve the symbol by yourself. We define on the effective address over here, we define the structures. We call the card here Genius Code 512. And then on the local store, we may, we may refer this is effective address resolution or something we call EAR. We, we refer to this one as ER um, underscore G underscore full structure. And down these programs, we refer that one is called as a local underscore full 512. So once we define the structures as a CSOF, EAR, we can refer, uh, we use this structure here, we demate the transaction in between those two locations without worrying about who is the affective address, who is the local store, right? Remember when we do the MFC get, MFC put, we need to know, we need to supply the local store address, the affective address, the size, and the tab, right? Some things that we need to, but the two address we have to supply is those guys. And this, in, in this mechanism, in this, uh, in this implementation, you don't have to, okay? 
parallel programming models. This is traditional parallel programming models in your existing architectures, also applied to this cell environment as well. This is based on the interacting of the single SP programs. Um, we implement the parallel SP programs here. Synchronization mechanism will provide you the MFC atomic update commands. Remember when we draw the architectures of the MFC, we have a various components. The MFC, remember, we have the MMU, we have the atomic. Atomic would handle the cache coherency for us. The MMU is doing the memory address translation unit for us. Right? And the action with some buffers in there, we use for the mailbox, we use for the buffers. Very simple, very neat organizations. And here it is showing that we use the cache line based MFC atomic update and mechanism, and that one was implemented in the MFC. We use the mailbox in there, we use signal notification registers, and events interrupts, we handle all of those, right? Even in, any interrupts can be handled by the SPE and then transferred back to the PPE to handle it. Uh, if we have all of those head interrupt handlers, we run on the PPE. Share memory, we can use the, uh, the share memory uh, processor and multiprocessor environments. In this scheme, um, the memories of the EA can be shared or a, a segment or a, a, a address space and the EA can be reserved, can be shared and synchronized. The accessing mechanism will be synchronized by a typical synchronization mechanism. Okay. Compile OpenMP support. We use the OpenMP here to control, to provide the parallelisms for the um, SMP systems where we connect those BE, uh, CBE together. Okay. And we use MPI, message passing um, interfaces, protocols to, to support the, the clustering. Both the OpenMP and MPI will be available in the SDK 3.0. Okay. Message passing, we use MPI, okay, message passing here. And one of the model we would, would like to touch about, um, spend some time here, is the, the streaming model. And this model here, we assume that we have a set of input, right? We call it in I0, I1, I2, I3, I4, I5. Our data split into a, a different set of inputs here. And then the applications or the programs running on this, in, on this uh, memory here, okay, can, can send the data down for this SPE program. Okay, SPE programs here receive the I0, the first um, SPE receive the first set of data, processing the data, send it back. At the same time, the data I1 was sent out to the SPE1 and then processing and send it back. At the same time, I3, I4, I5 will be sent out to the I, uh, SPE3 and 4 and 5, right? So what we're doing is that we break up a set of data into a small pieces, streaming down the set of data down to different SPE, and have the SPE perform those functions whatsoever, irrespective of the time. We don't care about the times. When it finish, send it back, get it out, 01, 02, 03, whatever, and then we process another set of data. That's how we perform the matrix multiplication, we subdivide the matrix into sub-matrices, and we do the performance you know, into pieces, and then we send out the data. The same SPU program, we design on SP0, 1, 2, 3, depending how we create a thread. We create a thread, fill in the data, give it some pointers to some address space, you know, point this, this address of the set of data here, this data structure, get that address, DMA the data down to the uh, SPE, and then perform. Another model is that if we know sometimes, if we know ahead of times, the, 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 um, the completions times of our task, of our SPE, we can implement something like a, the, um, the pipeline model, where we said, okay, I bring my data down to the first SPE. Let it finish and move and send the data to the zone to the, SPE, the next SPE. Let that, that SPE finish. Working that one finish, send it to next SPE, and send it to next SPE, to next SPE. Very beautiful concept, right? Dangerous, because we need to know when this guy is 
finish when the first SPA is zero finish when the second SPA is um, when the second when the second SPA finish we want one of the advantage of the SPA is that is what the times um, uh, we always want to to know the uh, the completion time the um, given what we call the terminology here the time to response or the um, the, the time at a real time response right always we guarantee the same response time every time okay if we can do that we can guarantee that one in this scheme is very good for you multitasking we can pick up again at the at the Linux level or, or at the it either at the open system at the kernel levels or at the, the user space level here we can break up our task or our, uh, our, our workload into different tasks we can task a b c and d over, over here associated with, with, with each task we have a an event and we have a queue of events here and depending on the occurrence of this event and we, we run that task all right so we we need to have some program we call the event dispatcher similarly to what we had before like the, some kernel some the SPE kernels which is an SPE program series the control program to manage that those events or to control the events here all right and control events recognize the events when the events happen fill that events and dispatch the task to, to serve that events <coughs> self management tasking Again, we have an SP kernels running here, and the, uh, the the job queues which queuing a number of tasks, and based on the um, the, um, the events happens now in the SP kernels here, we can download DMMA the data, the code down to the SP and run it through. Multitasking SP kernel manage. This is uh, explanations of what I will just describe. Okay. Some of the programming models here reduce development costs while achieving higher performance. This is true for the software cache. This is true for the um, for the multi buffering schemes. And then you know some of these framework we provide here we use uh, will be um, helpful uh, to your productivities and to your um, um, time to solutions. Developing your code is a lot quicker. The models we propose here is not only models, right? And we discuss this model applicables only in the environment where we have a cell, a cell BE, right? We have a one PPE, ASP, or we have a two PPE, sixteen SP, right? What happened in the environment where you have a a system, traditional system? running and using the cell accelerator cell is an accelerator you have to come up with that model as well what happened if that traditional cpu or tra tra traditional pc or traditional um, system was running fully loaded handling database uh, fielding data from your financials uh, services or so on and you have to handle different io devices you know bringing the data in that model is not addressed in here, right? How do we fit that data? How the data coming in through to that is that um, traditional CPU send it down to the SPE, one of our SPE, uh, one of our PPE, and then, then send it down to the SPE. And what happens if you integrate or you hook up and you build a cluster of those is, um, traditional CPU together and use the cell here as an accelerator? one or more or, or ten whatever a number of cells here is an accelerators right performance very specific functions rendering an image processing a set of financial data your um, um, your stock um, options for example right look at you know the um, uh, the hedge funds so you can you know build up your funds uh, today based on the, the data on the real, real time data so this sort of um, accelerators 
models is existing now. We call the hybrid model, and those are not addressing here. Questions? We 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 do that now. We build some model. We call the um, accelerated libraries framework, ALF. Okay, and that framework was introduced in SDK 2.0, addressing the the situation where you have to support the um, a hybrid model is between a traditional CPU and the cell as an acceler accelerator. Okay. Um, we may not go into the detail of that models because it's still working on, and then so it's, it's a lot of details involved that one. But that models. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about what, the, what are the requirements that you fit to that model? Let's say that you have an application running on your, um, on your main, uh, on your um, x86 based machine, right? On your traditional CPU. One application running that one. And you want to send some piece of code out here so you can accelerate it on the on CBE. What do you think you need to do? Why you want, what do you want this cell accelerator to do? What do you want him doing? The task, you have to break it, the task, your big task over here into small task, you can send it out. Application partitioning, right? You have to partition your application into pieces. Same model here, but at the, on the other hand, Partitioning your data, your, your application into small segments or small pieces, and then move it which, which pieces go to this SPU, or which piece go to this PPU, or which piece go to this cell. Because you may have a more than one cell accelerators, right? More than one PS3 here. Nobody is saying that you cannot build a cluster with PS3, right? And if you follow you know, some of the, the online um, news lately, the past week or so, some students only build a cluster of PS3. And that cluster of PS3, you know, if you couple that cluster of PS3 with a, a, a system, a, a cluster of um, traditional CPU, you build a supercomputing center, or you build a, a very, very powerful system here. Application partitioning is one area, right? Application partitioning, you also have to hand a lot, a lot of data coming in as well. You do the data partitioning. So you have to think about the scheme of your partition your data as well. And then receiving the data, right? You, you are just computational, right? You receive data. You, as a programmer, you have to think about that framework IOF has to provide you something that you can fit the data. Fit it easily. You're not going out here, you're not, as a programmer, you're not doing the DMA by yourself. You issue one DMA and go get data, DMA, this, that. You build a list of data, whatever, or you do the software cache to do it better. But that framework has to provide it. Those are the features of the AOF, you know, you will see. Data partitioning, application partitioning, hiding away the DMAs, doing double buffering. It is now doing double buffering. In the future, it will do a multi-buffering as well for you. And of course, do a DMA list. I think that we cover the DMA list tomorrow. <coughs> Those are the kind of programming models that IBM is working on, okay? We're not stopping at those programming models, and you as a programmers, you know, when you're working on different models, you may see this model here, did talk about this model, this model does not fit to my, my environment here. I mean, it's something else. And that's coming up, you know, with the parallel programming aspect that you're working on, right? And so you can see that, is there anything that I had before, or is there anything that in my, in my course and my project here, I can use this? or uh, should I invent something else? And nobody stop you to invent anything else besides this model. These are just our model. We think we have this, we have this environment, we have this local store, we have an effective address you know, stored here, and we come up with some scheme that we feel that's comfortable. But as we're dealing with the going out and we expand the horizon of these um, architectures and features, we encounter more questions, you know, your questions on how to, um, to handle your question of the hybrid models, it's common now with the hybrid models that we discussed, but you said, you thought about it. Okay, this model is fine, but you know, I have a traditional CPU, the machine I run, I mean, I can hook up this cell here, this uh, PS3, how do I do that? The hybrid model is a very important model. Nobody's going to use this model by itself, except you know, me and you and some of the games player, right? But when you put together a real world and build a real super center, Okay, 
And yes, it's possible, it potentially, and that's what we're doing now. IBM is doing with the Los Alamos Labs on the Roadrunner projects. It does not to stop you to build your own pro projects here with the cluster of the PS3 or cluster of the, the cell plate. Okay, so we manage cache. We mentioned this one is the, um, the, the techniques that allow you to reserve, uh, allocate a, a, a segment down your local store and use it as a cache and you manage it. You as a programmer manage it. You may ask why you ask me to do so many things. I write programs, right? And I have to write the cache too. I have managed the cache too. This is hardware design. This machine was designed by the hardware guys and those hardware guys give you a lot of freedom. The software guys said that, okay, either I take these freedoms or not. I'm waiting for AOF and some of the models you know, to help me better. But for those of you that really want to get to the lower levels, that want to control, okay, give that 256K byte, right? You can control that one. I have my own cache here. I have a two cache, I have a three cache, I have a number of cache I can play with. Every time that I add some cache in, right, I can see some improvement. There was proven uh, some program that we have to demo here. The demo will be with three cache, four cache, five cache, and so on. And every time that we add some more cache, right, the performance improve, get you know jump another another five phone, another five x, another six x, whatever, right? Because what is boiling down, if we relocate it or we make the data available to 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 our CPU, to our SPU, then you, we should load and store, load and store and run. That's all we do, right? We don't have to pay any any latency in terms of memory latency. The question is that if you reserve a one SPE, the local store of one SPE is a cache, right? And let the other SPE access that cache. How efficient it is. If you reserve one SPE is a cache, that local store, in order to access, in order to access that local store from any SPE, you have to provide some SPE IDs to create the thread, the thread, right? And you use that SPE to go on over there go over to the EA address and, and, and fetch the data, you know, from go to that route because you have the memory map, the data from the local store, you map the EA and so on, right? So efficiency, implementation-wise, no, nobody can say no because you can access a local space in the, this LSE um, um, on, the, on the SPE 0 here can be accessed by SPE 1. Nobody said no. But since so we, we say that we use the SPE is a computational engine, so we prefer to use that way. Okay, here's the basic cache concepts. Everybody familiar with this one? Skip, going through. Cache, cache line, right? Okay, we use the cache, we have the size, and all these um, N weight, the N set, how many weight, we have partition, the cache line, the set. I don't remember. I mean, when we look at the um, the new architectures, if you're not the designer, right, you are just a programmer, when you look at the description and specification of the new Intel, new Intel CPU and so on, you look at the cache, you set up the size, the cache size, then what? Yeah, you sit down your program, right? And here you say that, okay, I have to know a little bit about that organization. I have to know a little bit about, you know, what, is, what does it mean to me? The fully associative mappings, right? And then the anyway, set associative mapping here. We have direct mappings. Okay, we map everything to cache line, and we fully associate mappings where we map any memory location to a cache line. Your cache consists of a number of cache lines, right? Okay, so you have that cache line, and how do you organize those cache lines in group, in single one, or how you map that cache line, or a group of cache line to a, a set of locations in your memory here. So your cache, the buffers or the, the, the data on that memories into this cache line. And that's allow you to access the cache. Okay. This one is applicable to the, the local store only. And these benefits are the same benefits that you observe when you have a hardware cache. Simplifies programming models. From your load and store effective address model can be used, decrease the time to port to SPE, 
the advantage of locality of reference. That's the traditional one. That's why we have the cache. Come on, right? Can be easily optimized to much data access patterns. This is new here, right? This is a software managed cache. Provide ability to apply sophisticated replacement algorithms and so on. Do we invent this software managed cache? I don't think so. If you search through Google, a lot of people work in a software managed cache. Right? This is not IBM's inventions. This is the one that invented by many, many technical and technical communities. We saw the concepts, the fit environment here, we use it. Right? So we suggest you, you know, if you see something that's new or that's been used or whatever, you can retrofit the, the concepts out to here in the cell, use it. Right? In some ways, you can exploit certain features of cell here. We explore this one because we say that we want to prefetch the data. Okay? We need to have data to supply that SPU. We want to prefetch it. How do we do? Provide a cache. That's it. And where do we get the cache? We go now searching for what, how do we implement the cache. This cache concept has been discussed in IBM like a f four or five years since the beginning. They just implement, actually implemented and done and released on the SDK 2.0 only. So to see how long does it take, you know, a couple of years, three or four years to implement this, this, uh, this scheme here. We talk about a lot, in the, a lot of software cache in the SDK 1.0, but only in the 2.0 we have actual implementation and we do have some examples to show you. Okay. The, the heading file is the cache um, minus API. I think cache is called it's cache minus API dot H here. And in here, uh, the cache attributes consist of name, associativity, the line size, the read only, or the read and write, okay, the type of data object to cache, integers, cards, float, and so on, and the number of sets. User can define the multiple cache by redefining the attributes. Every time, every definition, every software cache has to be defined by including the, um, um, the, the cache API here and then the attributes. You want the new, the second software cache, you repeat this, sec this section here, right? The cache API and the attributes and so on. So you can define N software cache as, as, you, as you want to. The attributes are cache type, the type of your data, right? The name of your cache, and then the, uh, the size, the sets, the end way, the type, read and write, or read only, the read x4. This one is mean that each time you do a read, you read the four words here, and then the, the cache stats give you the statistic of the cache. Defining a cache. I define a cache name, my cache, cache type, my type is called T, four way, eight sets, read and write, um, cache line is nine, and then there is the start enables and included cache API. Cache read, cache write, cache touch, wait, read and write. And these are the, um, the interface. To make life simple and easier for you to use these features, you are required only to supply the type and the name of the cache only. All of the rest, the set, the way, whatever, leave it to us. We set a default. You can, of course, change. But if you don't want to specify anything, leave it to us. We define default for you. And the, um, the re replacement algorithms, you know, first in, first out, so on like that, we define it for you. And you just care about the name and the type of your cache only. Okay, here is an example. We use the cache to swap two values. Okay, and we use the cache read. Cache read here is an interface provided by, by the software the, um, cache utilities, right? And cache, the effective address 8 over here, read the, the, um, the, the cache into address 8, read from the cache specified by my items. The name of the cache is my, minus card items into address 8. Okay, and then read again my items in the B here, and then write write eight over here, eight into the address into the into the cache, my items, also to the address effective address A in the score B here, and then write B into A. So what we did, we read value eight out, we read, we 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 read B, we put B into uh, we would A into B, we put B into A. We switch we swap two values.
behind the scene what we actually doing we have to issue an MFC something put right or get something go to effective address A or B get that data, get that data bring it down to the, to the local, uh, local install program to the SPU exchange the data switch that one MFC put back a number of, of, um, of MFC command we have to issue here we just do cash read and cash write that's it write back algorithms you know some of these algorithms here the same things that we talked about in the hardware when we learn our architecture uh, class same thing this is the graph a chart showing the implementation of the cache the, the log and modify and valid you know some directories of your cache here to look up form the index and so on just a kind of performance wise okay this is um, kind of showing the size of the cache line here the line size and then the hit rate okay and applicable to the program quick sort hit rate versus the line size and um, the, the, the cache size is about uh, 8k 16k 32k 64k 128k so as we can see you know the hit rate uh, about from 75 percent improved to 85 something almost 82 percent very high rate however is with the 32 um, byte um, cache um, the line size and then you know we go on as a further the, the lines getting uh, longer and longer or getting bigger and bigger we see the performance really decrease so depending on if you have a large a small line size 128 or something and this line over here that's the, the line size of our cache okay you see we see some different improvements in terms of the cache size okay the hit rate um, improved a little bit with the large 128 k byte cache size 128 k byte that's half of my local store would you dedicate a half your local store to your cache no way my friend right i mean maybe it's enough 16k to buy or something like that right and 6k so again different programs different um, approach different techniques different results this is the quick sort run time versus line size and this is the hit rate versus the line size and different hip sort right this is a hip, this hip sort behavior more or less based on the cache size as well we can see that you know these guys uh, the, the hit rate jump between you know 76 77 percent or 80 something percent okay run time run time versus the line size again and cast start uh, the set right to set organize the cash line in terms of set how many set do we have we have a uh, eight set seven here a one or two or whatever differ a little bit right the hit rate hit percentage here hit rate almost the same thing 94 percent or 91 percent based on the written right the set here on the quick sort with the prefetch and write uh, buffers almost the same so experience with your programs and then with your um, all right let's go any questions before we close up here okay ladies and gentlemen wrap it up and let's go to the labs <laughs>